Do the trashy pulp novels of the world have anything to offer? Our bestseller is all they're cracked up to be. Here at Terrible Book Club, we explore whether you really can judge a book by its cover or its ridiculous synopsis. You ever passed a book and thought, ugh, who's reading this? We probably are. I'm Ken. And I'm Dee. And with us today are Chris. Hello. And Paris. Hello. Fucking did it. Yes. <laughs> Fuck yeah. Starting 2024 right. <laughs> it only took four years of us <laughs> podcasting together. Training has paid off. Four years of pod marriage was what it took. We went to counseling <laughs> together. Yeah, me. we did. <laughs> And now we can finally start a podcast, which is Antiques Freaks and Terrible Book Club combining into the Terrible Antique Book Freaks to bring Hooray. you yet another story from William Hope Hodgson. Hooray! Yeah, we ran we ran out of necks, but then we found this near neck, another near neck. Yeah, it turns out people were way more prolific with their creative works in the era before Netflix. Yeah. And this guy wrote a bunch. <laughs> So we're stuck here doing this forever, is what you're saying. Uh-huh. You're trapped in here with me. Oh, okay. I don't know. That's not uh, well, you know, thing. yeah, I can, I'm fine with that. Yeah. We've gone to couples therapy, so, like, it's fine if we're in the hole together now. I mean, we can work out <laughs> all of our problems now. We learn to communicate in the hole. Yes. All right. Uh, and we've learned to communicate primarily through bad fiction. Yes. 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 We've learned that that's the medium <laughs> which we best interact. <laughs> All right, Ken, tell the tell the good listeners what we're reading and how we're doing it today. Today we are reading the short story The Getting Even of Tommy Dodd by William Hope Hodgson, originally published in The Red Magazine on August 15th of 1912 and later republished as The Apprentice's Mutiny in Sea Stories. So this is a non-Karnacki story by our good boy William Hope Hodgson. One of his nautical tales from which we can only assume he is drawing on his early life experience as a sailor. Pops up a lot for him. <laughs> yeah, you wonder why Ken's always recommending these. You wonder. To be fair, wonder no I more. only knew about him for the ghost shit. I had no idea he was a sailor. And then I started looking for more stories after we ran out of Karnacki. And here we are. Oh, well. Oh, yeah, it just turns to... out that all people who love Victorian era, including the Victorians themselves, also like nautical shit. I mean, it makes sense. <laughs> Well, we're, someone's getting even in here. Is, yeah. is Tommy Dodd getting even or is he getting evened with? Is he the... I think he is getting... Yeah, I think he's getting even with someone else. So it's like a revenge fantasy or something. We will be reading this Eye of Aragon style, which means we will each be reading for as long as we can until we fuck up or crack up, at which point it passes to the next reader and heckling is strongly encouraged. All right. Who wants to begin first today? How often do I start? Have I ever started? I don't know. We never keep track of this shit. I think you do start sometimes. Go, Chris, go. Okay, here we go. I, I, Paris warned me that the second line was something, so yeah, let's, fucking, let's see where we go. Yeah, get, Paris get cheated. I didn't <laughs> mean to. My <laughs> eyes... First things first. <sighs> My eyes went to the word. I didn't mean for it to happen. Sometimes, you know, your eyes are just looking and you see something and you fixate on it because you're a human trying to read a word. I can't relate to that. I can't relate to that at all. Sometimes my eyes are not looking. I've never been a human. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. It's time. We're back in the neck, everyone. All right. Get, get ready. Get Let's even. Turn up the neck. All right. The getting even of Tommy Dodd. I believe the young beggar will too, said James, the eldest apprentice. They were in the glory hole of the Lady Hannibal, and Dayron, <laughs> the youngest apprentice. 
Hey, age why is there a glory hole and... on this ship already? Oh, does okay, that okay. Meaning? So I am going to break in <laughs> right here and okay. right now and be our lovely and tell everyone yes. what a glory hole means in this particular context. The noun no. glory hole. In 1825, meant drawer or box where things are heaped together in disorderly manner, and it is from this meaning that in the early part of the 20th century, it had come to mean the nautical use of small room between decks. It is typically the quarters on a ship that are occupied by the stewards or the stokers. So it was a junk drawer that then became the shittiest accommodation on the ship that then became a place where dicks are anonymously sucked. <laughs> That's yes. reasonable. All right. I'm pretty I mean, sure it's not the latter definition. Yeah, yeah. It got gotcha. there eventually somehow. Is That's I think what the point I'm is Paris is trying to make. Yeah. So there's, there's a little are yada yada in the middle of there. I don't think are, it gets there in the course of this story specifically. Oh, no, of course Are they not, not all a <laughs> no. junk drawer, if you will? Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, oh how we'll laugh. Ho, 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 ho. Well, thank you, Ken, for that uh, historical linguistic reference. We appreciate that. Thank you for being serious among our juvenile behavior. Yeah. All right. So for everyone listening at home, we're not, we're not, there's no dicks being sucked. There's just a, a shitty room where the shittiest of staff are or something. Okay. Five I feel like the substitute teacher of podcasting. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have to listen to you. You're just a sub. <laughs> I'm going to keep calling it a glory hole for dick sucking. Anyway, Darren, no. the youngest apprentice, aged 14, and known aboard by the name of Tommy Dodd, so it was Darren, but he's Tommy, okay, yeah, what the fuck? had been expounding a plan to get level with everybody in general, it seemed. For Tommy had been tasting another dose of that gross injustice which is dealt out so liberally to the boys in some ships. Uh, I'll fairly make the old man a fool, you'll see, he said. And as for that old bosun and the third mate and the steward, I'll make them wish they'd never been born. Fancy the pig breaking all the stops on the fore, main, and mizzen just at eight bells as I was coming below to dinner and then sending me up to put new ones on. It's taken me two hours, and now the beastly dinner's cold, and I've no time for a sleep or anything. And he's done that every day this week for my afternoon watch below. I told him he was a bully when he did it again today, and look what he's done. And Tommy rolled up his trousers to show his dong, to show a great abraded no. bruise, Whoa. where the third mate he had punched kicked me in the him. Dong. <laughs> the third mate had kicked him with his heavy boots in the dong. I hit him twice in his stomach, but he held my hands and kicked me till I was sick. Look at my shins! And he showed his shins, cut and bruised in a dozen places by the third mate's boots. James and the other apprentice in the port watch bent and looked at the boy's legs, nodding their heads with a sort of savage sympathy. If Tommy tries that idea of his for the homeward passage, I guess I'll help him for all I'm worth, said James. I will say that for the old man, remarked Tommy, he sung out to the third to go steady when he was kicking me, but all the same, he turned on me himself and told me I deserved what I'd got. I was in such a wax, I told him straight out that if I had been even half his size, I'd have wiped the deck with both him and the third mate. He kicked me bang off the poop then. Down the poop <laughs> ladder on the main deck. I hate to get kicked bang off the poop. <laughs> oh, down the poop ladder too. When I said that, but when I got to the bottom, I told him that after I'd wiped the deck with them, I'd make him kiss my feet to teach him to know a man when he saw one. It's like you know, six Tommy. different fetishes in one sentence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot, a lot going on there. A lot of dimensions. You know, Tommy, said James, you're a plucky kid, but you'll be murdered outright one of these days if you don't mind. <laughs> James is <laughs> on point. They're already ki literally Tommy, kicking you to death. Tommy, I will kill your ass. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have said Keep what you said. Keep your head on a said. fucking swivel, Tommy, because it's coming. <laughs> I wouldn't have said what you said to the old man for the value of the ship. Anyway, ended Tommy. The first mate likes me. I know that. Uh, I think Tommy's in for some additional pain as the story goes <laughs> Just on. Just viciously kicks Ooh, at all yeah. times. A few days later, Tommy got across the bosun's hoss, 
concerning the cleaning of the pigsty, which the bosun had set Tommy to do every morning watch for a fortnight past, and which, properly, should have been done by the hands when they washed the decks. All right, yo, if anybody's listening to this and English is not your first language, I'm really sorry, because this is confusing yeah. even to me <laughs> as a native English speaker. There are just words in here from 150 years ago that no one uses anymore. Do you know, I, you know what I do when I hear these things? I just assume it's a part of a ship or a task on a ship and just keep rolling with it. I'm like, you know what? I actually don't need to know what a bosun haws pigs die and the bosun in the Fortnite and the docks. You know, it's fine. I don't need to know. Fill it in. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's a good. Uh, that's good. That's a good uh, uh, philosophy to have. I actually know most of this because I am. You know, I do. Uh, you are a with ship Ken. yourself, actually. <laughs> I am. I am a ship. Is the thing. Oh, that old D. What a ship. So, in this case, I believe the pigsty is a literal pigsty because you would keep pigs and other animals on board to butcher as needed throughout the voyage. Oh, that is smart. I don't know what the... Ho- to get across I- the bosun's hoss, I believe, is to just get on the bosun's bad side. Bosun being the uh... contraction for the term boat swain, which is a guy who tells other guys to do things on a boat. Oh, so he's like the middle manager on the boat, like below the first mate and the captain? Correct. Oh, all right. Thank you, Ken. Once again, Ken's very helpful realism from Earth <laughs> coming to us and <laughs> writing this this terrible, antique, freaky ship here. So Tommy's upset because cleaning the pigsty should be done by the people who are in charge of cleaning the deck as a whole. It should not fall exclusively to a little kid like Tommy. And yeah. they're bullying him by making him do the dirty, smelly part of cleaning the ship. And also kicking the fucking shit out of him. <laughs> Literally. Yeah, I mean, you know. Kicking the snot out of his ass. They kicked him bang off the poop. The shit was kicked yeah, out of bang off the poop, man. <laughs> the poop refers to the poop deck, also known as the hind castle. It is the elevated deck oh, yeah, on that's, the... That's what I call hind that castle? That's also what I call yeah. my ass. <laughs> <laughs> that is the back half of my deck right there. Yeah. My hind castle. Mm, yes. Kiss my hind castle. <laughs> Oh, my crenellations going right there. (laughs) When the bosun came forward from washing down the poop, he found to his pained amazement that Tommy had not touched the pigsty except with the seat portion of one of his garments. For the boy was sitting calmly on the top of the sty, smoking a cigarette, his bucket and broom reclining beneath him on the deck. The bosun expressed fluently... Yo, don't smoke, but that's cool as fuck. (laughs) (laughs) Like, like smoking's bad, smoke but like, how cool is that? <laughs> the, the bosun expressed fluently his distress at this condition of affairs and suggested, with the aid of the broom handle, that Tommy Dodd should get to work at his accustomed dirty task. Clean it yourself, said Tommy the instant the bosun had loosed him. Clean it yourself, you old bully, if your back ain't too fat to bend. <laughs> oh! <laughs> He avoided further acquaintance with the broom handle, and catching up his bucket of water, hove the contents in the bosun's face, then made a sprint for the poop, dodged the broom which the bosun threw, and returned the bucket as interest, cracking the bosun on the shin, and afterwards continuing at top speed to the poop. The bosun arrived almost in the same instant, and Tommy Dodd would certainly have fared very badly, but for the interference of the mate, who told him that he would deal with Tommy... Later, he gave orders privately to the bosun that he must ease up on the boy, or he, the mate, would have something to say in the matter. Yet, in spite of the efforts of the first mate to keep Tommy out of serious trouble, the boy had several narrow escapes from real bodily injury, for the third mate and the bosun were by nature bullies, and the captain, though, as I have said, not a bad man, was a very hasty-tempered and hard by nature, so that when all is said and done, poor Tommy had a very rough and brutal time of it on the way out. And hence, as I have hinted, who, who's I? Tommy's plot to avenge himself <laughs> and the others, for it must not be supposed that he had any monopoly when rough treatment was being handed out. And of the plot and its workings, you will have a chance to judge as you read on. Can y'all just feel you the pennies being wrung <laughs> out of every sentence? Just... You know, he the only part of his body who had touched the pig's die was the seat of his garment as he was sitting on the thing. And, and if you continue a- to read, you'll find out what the story oh, is. Oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine knowing that you're such a bad writer that you have to be like, no, no, please, come on. Stick around. 
Okay, uh, next sentence is troubling. As Tommy himself put it, I make a spiffing girl when I've got the right togs on. Oh I've acted Ooh. often at home. You'll see if I don't fool them all. Okay, is, is oh, how, okay, hold on. How is he getting even? I need to ask. Oh, yeah, pause. pause. How getting is he getting even? even? Being a femboy is a new... Uh... <laughs> yeah, that's... Uh, yeah, cross-dressing to get back at some... Okay. Is he gonna I'll be show like, them. Ha-ha. I'll be fucking hot. Like, oh, <laughs> you showed them. All right. I mean, I guess being And being thus hot. the definition of glory hole was forever changed. Yeah. From... <laughs> oh, no. No, I mean, I do think, yeah, is this going to be like, haha, I tricked them into fucking me? Because that's, <laughs> that's my worry. I don't that's my worry. think that's so. I, I don't pray. think so. It isn't. Okay. Uh, Proceeding. Still scared. From now until the Lady Hannibal reached Melbourne, there were long and secret conferences in the Prentice's birth or glory hole during which the plan was fully matured. As James remarked, it should go off all right, you know. The skipper's an awful old fool over any girl he can get to talk to him. And Tommy should be able to fetch him. You know, guys, when you know when you just oh, said that's okay. not what it is. <laughs> oh, the this isn't going the way I wanted sure, it to go. The old this man old... was sure to want to kiss you, Tommy. Said one of I the princesses like <laughs> in the yep. other watch. Mm. What'll you do then? Mm. I'll smack his face for him, good and hard. Said Tommy with gusto okay. at the thought. Guess I'll get right. square with him, and I'll fix the third mate, too. You'll see. When Melbourne was reached, the Prentices clubbed their spare cash and thereafter took to frequenting milliners and other shops dedicated to the daintying of woman. At the conclusion of their purchases, the whole six of the young rascals carted the bundles into the Prentices' berth, and having locked the door and covered the ports... Master Tommy Dodd went through an elaborate trying on. At the end of his efforts, however, a queer silence possessed the glory hole. Oh, man, that's never <laughs> not what a well. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, they All spent right, money on this? Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, now who's getting clowned, you know? Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, we'll show him. For Tommy, when finally dressed from pretty shoes, which his slender feet and years allowed to be surprisingly small, Uh, to his mop of naturally curly golden hair made so dainty a girl that his fellow apprentices felt all at once different towards him. Please, God. God. (laughs) Ken, did you do this on purpose? (laughs) You know he did. Oh, God. He looked so like a girl. It was James who voiced the general feeling when he said abruptly, By George, youngster, you make a pretty girl. As James made the remark, there came a sharp Mm. rap on the berth door and the voice of the third mate demanding admittance. The lads looked from one to the other in complete dismay, but Tommy perceived suddenly... Yeah, there's going to be a third mate, all right. (laughs) Ugh, jeez. Tommy perceived suddenly that the advent of the third mate might prove helpful rather than otherwise. Moreover, it was a good chance to test the efficiency of his disguise, and he whispered to the others to let the officer in quickly before he began to suspect that something was up. This the lads now did, and the third mate burst in roughly with a coarse remark and looked suspiciously round. Then he saw the girl, standing demurely quiet by the table, and at sight of her quite extraordinary prettiness, he became suddenly so polite that Tommy nearly burst out laughing. Instead, however, he took up his part in earnest and looked at him with a primly disgusted look that made the whole coarse bulk of the third mate abruptly realize itself, which cannot have been pleasant for him. Then Tommy turned to James and said aloud, but in a nicely modulated voice, Well then, Mr. James, when you see my cousin, Mr. Darren, (laughs) will you tell him, please, that his cousin, Annie Darren, has been down to see him and that I should like him to come up and spend a couple of days with us if the captain will let him. (laughs) It's it's (laughs) so flawless. You're just just so naturally feminine. Uh, I know. It's it's so natural. It's like Tommy himself. Not fake at all. The third mate, staring foolishly at this dainty girl of apparently near 17 years, realized suddenly that she must be cousin to Tommy Dodd, though he had forgotten until that moment that the youth was properly named Darren. 
He made a resolve that as soon as Tommy came aboard, he would be nice with him. He hoped that Tommy would not blacken him to this pretty girl, who called the youngest Prentice cousin, and had come down to invite him up, probably to some fine house. That was the worst of these beastly Prentices. You never knew how to treat them, or where you had them. When you got into port, they had such swagger people. I love how they're like, in quotation marks. Yes. Yeah, I love how they're like, well, I guess I better treat people better so I can fuck their sibling or cousin. It's like, yeah, that's I gotta not get, the I gotta reasoning. fuck your sister. It's not the reasoning, y'all. For his part, Tommy, as he explained to the others afterwards, had killed many birds with one stone. By the simple act of letting the third mate see him as his supposed girl cousin, he had slain at birth any suspicions which might afterwards have arisen at the likeness of the girl, Jenny, both in face and voice, to Tommy Dodd, the apprentice. Further, I, all right, that was that's a that was really saying slain at birth was pretty heavy for what they were describing. <laughs> yeah, it's very it's metal, metal, which was yeah. a thought. <laughs> Getting a little intense there, bud. Further, he had ensured a cessation of the third mate's bullying all the time that they were in port. He had also provided means whereby he could receive invitations from himself to spend the day ashore, and these invitations could be easily extended to the rest of the berth. For as the girl cousin Jenny, Tommy Dodd felt that felt that B could easily persuade the captain. Does that say B it or do, it does say B? It, it does do say B. B. Okay, it that do B. B. I just want to make sure that's not a stumble. No, that, that is as no, you, you you read it pretty well, yeah. Okay. Felt that be. I just felt that B could easily persuade the captain to grant such relaxations as those he now proposed to himself. Later, as he hoped, he would rather see <laughs> other means of utilizing oh, this. Oh, he new... would see other means. You added a rather there. Uh, that, was really, yes. that was a really. That was a. That was, Nerds. that was a really good, really good. Uh, it's all the heebies. The bee he That's actually in the context of the story. You got the heebie jeebies. It <laughs> yes. fucked you up. Okay. I believe it's one of the antiques. I mean, you cut story. through 2,000 words of it, so you did a pretty good job there, Chris. That's yeah. one third. Hell yeah. Good Putting work. it down. Good work. Okay. Which antique freak shall be he? D, is it thee or me? It is D. Later, as he hoped he would see other means of utilizing this new and delightful power which he had created. In the meanwhile, the third mate, as Tommy had already grown to expect, was toning down to the others, and finally asked James in a low voice to introduce him to Miss Jenny. This was achieved, and the third mate laid himself out in a grotesque effort to make himself agreeable to pretty Miss Darren, finally offering to show her round the vessel, which offer was accepted with demure quietness. The third mate took the supposed girl around the poop, where the skipper was enjoying a stroll before going ashore for the evening. Here, seeing the chance of becoming introduced to the captain in his new character, Tommy evinced a quite extraordinary interest in the wheel, during which the skipper, perceiving that the girl was exceedingly pretty, strolled up within hearing and finally joined the third mate, much to that man's disgust, in explaining the action of the steering girl. <clears throat> That no, the steering girl? gear. <laughs> the, the steering, steering gear. gear. <laughs> Fuck. Oh. The steering gear. <laughs> We're mansplaining oh, steering wheels it. now. My so brain took over. Incredible. I was like, there's only one thing you steer. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I have, I have a question. Like, all right, all these dudes are really horny for this girl, but like, where do they think they're going to have sex with her? Just somewhere on the ship? Is that the answer? I, I don't think they're actually going to fuck her. They just want to have a nice train. They're going to run a train. Like, run a train. The answer to that yeah. first. Okay. They're going to go down the to the Laurel. train. <laughs> no, it, I, I think for me, the question <laughs> is, is like the date is just walking around the deck of the ship. Like there's the side of the ship. Here's the other side of the ship. Yeah. Here's the glory hole. It's, it's really cramped. I can cramped hear and... Ken bristling with envy from here. <laughs> it's like I can't believe it's got to go. <laughs> Ken would, oh, I, Ken, yeah, I feel like you I would love a date that was just being taken around a ship. Yeah, I would, true. but I would be the guy who was explaining things no one cared about is the problem. And this well, is yeah, the steering like, girl. <laughs> the steering girl wheel. Hey, you girl know what? We actually, we actually all kind of had a group date doing that when we walked around Little Ernestina model together. Did that is do true. That? Yeah, that's true. We did kind of go yeah. on a little date there. Yeah, we did do this that. This is a polyfuel now. At the now. scenic New Bedford Whaling Museum. Actually, you know what? Gotta say, after having not gone back for... 
I don't know, 20 something years. Going back as an adult was actually pretty solid. We spent a lot of time there. It was very good. Do recommend. Thank you. All right. I mean, I, this is not this is city. not this is not Ken propaganda. This is Paris having her own idea. <laughs> <laughs> Lest you I have be not shown paid the... Paris an extraordinary sum of money to say this on my behalf. <laughs> this episode not sponsored by the New Bedford Whaling Museum. Uh, we we, we do have concurrence, though, that both from someone who moved here to be closer to it and someone who moved away to be farther away from it, yeah. both of them really enjoy the Whaling Museum. You're correct, Dee, that's true. Between <laughs> the Twixt Ken and I, a ringing endorsement. <laughs> Ken will turn you into the steering girl if you say something yeah, that's about, true. Watch out. about the museum, though. <laughs> Ken right, has a whip y'all. and some very fine shoes. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Paris, it's your turn. Back to back to this side of the team. Woo. All right. Um, you know what? We just did yoga. I am I'm relaxed. I'm limber. I'm ready. Then this is the thing that makes the ship turn around. <laughs> said Tommy. Wow, so in interesting. No voice shit, Tommy. Pitching it a little near its ordinary compass for the edification of the five other apprentices whose face he saw craned around the edge of the port stairway. They didn't know what it was for, it, actually. Where it came <laughs> up to the deck. Oh, oh, it, oh! Yes, said the skipper, looking at her with approving eyes. I can see you're a clever young lady. Oh my Did god. Did you ever see that Twitter screenshot of a woman being like, sometimes on a date, I will pretend to be as stupid as possible and see to what extent a man will explain things to me? No, but that sounds delicious. I would love to sample that rarity. Tommy was aware that the watching faces had suddenly disappeared and that there were sounds of smothered laughter down on the main deck as his five birthmates scuttered shaking with wicked joy into the glory hole, there to enjoy to their heart's content, sucking each other off. I mean, the <laughs> idea of their old <laughs> of a captain telling his youngest apprentice that he was a clever young lady. That same Tommy, whom he had booted scientifically and indelicately but a few hours earlier. I would love I to give someone the scientific boot. <laughs> yeah, that is, that, is, that is curious. I have calculated the, the physics of this kick. <laughs> Up on the poop top, Paris waits. Okay. Um, <laughs> up on the poop, the skipper was still deep in explanations, which presently began to bore Tommy frightfully, so that he remembered suddenly that he must hurry home to tea. At this, the skipper actually beamed, and with a polite bow, asked the young lady whether he could not persuade her to honor his table with her presence. And Tommy consented so to do honor unto his captain by condescending for the first time to eat some of the cabin delicacies. Truly, as Tommy thought, this is all right, but as he remembered his toilet, I mustn't eat too much. <laughs> Haven't we all had that thought? Oh no, my yeah. toilet, I must not <laughs> I gotta, vomit. I gotta be nice I... to it. I, <laughs> I have been I want to scientifically boot my toilet. <laughs> oh, off the poop. All right. Uh, meanwhile, the captain had called the steward up on the poop and was busy laying the foundations for such a tea as Master Tommy had not eaten for many a long day. And, thought Tommy, as he harked, I'll get even with the steward before I'm done for all the gubbins he's done us out of and for all the short whacks of sugar and for that time he sneaked to the skipper when we threw spuds at him. And indeed, for many another crime against the glory hole, for the steward was a disagreeable man, and the high spirits of the apprentice's birth, which culminated in the body of Tommy Dodd, had always excited his ire and spite. Therefore was Tommy joyful in contemplation, the while that the skipper personally conducted the remainder of his tour round the ship, having told the disgusted third mate that he could go ashore any time he liked. <clears throat> Presently they came to the glory hole, and the skipper indicated the interior of the berth through the open doorway. Where my young gentlemen live, he said, adopting somewhat of a parental attitude to the youngsters who inhabited that gloomy but lively abode where dicks are sucked. He was not aware yet that Tommy no. complained as cousin by the pretty girl <laughs> at his side, but when this was explained to him, he adopted an attitude that was even more indicative of kindliness and benevolence, which rose a wicked idea in Tommy's mind. I should think you were a very kind captain to them, he said in the most girlish way possible and the captain spared not of emphasis to ensure this point being fixed in the mind of his newly found girlfriend, for he saw that along such lines lay the way to her liking and favor. Tommy, the girl, stepped in over the washboard, and all the apprentices rose and uncapped. 
What a quaint little place, said Tommy, parodying a remark of his sister's, which she had made when she came down in London to see the vessel in which her brother was to sail. And do they sleep on all those shelves? How funny! Then, as if the idea had come suddenly, Oh, Captain, couldn't we have tea in here? We could all have it together. It would be so homely. And if my cousin comes back, he could join in with us. Tommy clapped his hands, as if in ecstasy at the thought, and looked up at the skipper very nicely from under the longest lashes in the world, or so that elderly reprobate thought at the moment. I, uh, well, uh, said the skipper confusedly, and with the beginnings of a little irritation that somehow was held in check by the daintiness of Tommy's attitude of request. I, uh, I think the cabin will be nicer, Miss Jenny, don't you? Perhaps you're right, Captain, said Tommy thoughtfully, with his head of golden curls a little on one side, pondering. More room, too, added the skipper, brightening, as the danger seemed to be passing. Much more room. Yeah, said Tommy, nodding and peering round the gloomy little berth. This is a pokey little place. It is very pokey in the glory hole. Yeah, quite pokey in there. No. <laughs> Why don't you make your young gentleman <laughs> Pretty live with pokey. you in the cabin, Captain? Then the steward could look after them properly. It would be so nice to have them all with you. James, away in the corner of the glory hole, nearly choked. On the, the captain turned to the doorway <laughs> and on deck, hoping thus to change the conversation, which was becoming a practical difficulty for a sea captain troubled with paternal and benevolent instincts towards his young gentleman. Tea will be getting cold, Miss Jenny, he said, and held out a large hand to help Tommy, which the boy took, to assist him over the washboard. Then the boy turned and, look and looked back into the berth. Come along, all of you, he said. The captain says it will be nicer to have tea in the cabin, so there will be more room there. Be quick, the tea's getting cold. We'll all have a jolly tea together. Come on, Captain! This last to the distracted skipper, who had halted as if suddenly frozen, and finding this innocent but startling interpretation put upon his attempts at evading having to join his authority to the girl's suggestion to invite the whole berth to tea. For their part, the five prentices stood as still and stupid as the skipper, but presently James terminated the suspense by asking in so many words, are we to come, sir? No, you can't come in the glory hole. <laughs> Denied. Please don't come in the glory hole. This is only an edging hole. <laughs> of course, said Tommy, no. laughing happily. Didn't you hear the captain saying it would be nicer to have it in the cabin? But James still looked at the captain, who now saw that he could not possibly evade the invitation and still retain the high opinion which Miss Jenny had formed of him. He, therefore, with a fierce attempt to sound hearty, told the boys to follow, which they did, all more or less uneasy, because they understood perfectly the skipper's attitude in the matter, yet all of them, wordless with astonishment and admiration at the way in which Master Tommy Dodd was carrying it off. As they all sat down around the cabin table, with the captain at the head, the steward finished setting out the additional teacups for the five lads. Tommy noticed the way in which he was doing it, and saw how to avenge the bitter disgust which was on the man's disagreeable face. Oh, steward, he cried out in his clear voice, modulating the tone, so as to suggest only the astonishment of a daintily nurtured girl. You shouldn't put your fingers in the cups, and your hands are dirty, you know. The captain turned in his chair and saw that Miss Jenny was only too correct. He had never noticed these details before, but well, they seemed rank and dreadful before this pretty girl. He grew ashamed through the action of his servant and turned on him, his voice making the cabin ring. Steward, he roared. Go and wash yourself. Take all these cups and bring clean ones. You're only fit for hog feeding. Tommy Dodd had scored one victory over an enemy of the birth. Throughout the meal, as befits a privileged person, he ate cake only. He took moderate bites and little sips and remembered in time that rigid but nameless article which held his small and muscular waist so stiffly. Because he remembered he stopped in time. Uh, I guess he's, I guess he can't eat a lot because he's wearing a corset. Is that what that we're getting at? What is he? Yeah, I that's... think that's the implication. Yes, I okay. think he's gonna bust on out like fucking Hannibal through the wall. Why is he being? Coy I don't about know a that corset? William Hope Hobson has worn a corset himself, and I don't know that he knows how it works vis-a-vis -vis eating. So, so he didn't know he he what it is. is. What do you call it? Because he said that rigid but nameless article, like it. It's a corset. Yeah, I don't know why. This... It has a name. I don't think he's hiding it out of being coy. I think he's hiding it because he doesn't know what the fuck to call it. No, that's, that's weird. I, just, I, think, just weird. I think rigid but nameless article is the way to refer to it in print in a way that will not get the whole magazine seized. 
Right, because it's an undergarment, so you wouldn't. Yeah. You know. uh, okay. It's like saying her fucking panties, or you know, you, okay. you, know, you don't want right. all together. <clears throat> all the weeks that the vessel was in port, Tommy had the most glorious time. He received numberless invitations from himself, alias Miss Jenny Darren, which the captain allowed him to accept, for he could refuse nothing to the girl, who often paid him a visit on those days when Tommy had been allowed to accept an invitation ashore. This coincidence alone being sufficient to ensure Tommy's never having a refusal of leave from the skipper. The berth also was invited on several occasions, much to the disgust of the third mate who found himself excluded from such privileges. Yet dared not vent his anger on Tommy, whom he suspected of having told the things to the girl, lest, after all, he should be mistaken. For Miss Jenny took care not to drive him quite hopeless, but to utilize the situation to the best advantage so as to punish the hulking brute as far as possible with the whip of jealousy and yet to keep him hoping faintly, so that, in her more usual character as Tommy Dodd, she should have as free a time as possible from the bullying of that particular officer. Really drawing out that idea! Whew! All right, Huggy. (laughs) In time, the day came for the Lady Hannibal to sail for home, and the skipper paced the poop in an almost tearful mood, hoping to discover the figure of Miss Jenny on the wharf waving a goodbye. Yet in this, as you may think, he was bound to be disappointed, as was the third mate, who now realized definitely that he had no more to gain from the friendship of Master Tommy, and therefore took the first opportunity of soundly kicking the boy. I didn't get to fuck your cousin! <laughs> oh! <it's laughs> right. really fuck you, man! Weird reaction. <laughs> the assault of the third mate resulted in his getting rather hurt, for Tommy, desperate, pulled an iron pin from the wall and hit the third mate on the head, stunning oh. him for a moment. Oh. Then the first mate interfered and sent Master Tommy into the berth to be out of the way, warning him plainly to avoid the third. A consultation was held in the berth among the lads, and it was agreed that, all things being taken into account, Tommy had better do his disappearing trick without delay. That very night, in fact. It was James who saw Tommy fall overboard and gave the warning cry, which resulted in the vessel being hove to for something like a couple of hours whilst the boat plied round about the circles trying to find the boy. Naturally, having to return without him to the genuine grief of the first mate and the sorrow of the third, who would like to have kicked Tommy soundly <laughs> once more before his decease. God damn it, I couldn't get I wanted to kick him one more time, but I couldn't fuck his cousin. Oh. <laughs> However, it could not be helped. There was still left the five others, and he expended his sorrow conscientiously upon them. And so the Lady Hannibal sailed onward, minus at last that bright spirit of mischief and pluck, Tommy Dodd. Even as it was James who saw Tommy go, it was the same shameless lad who saw Miss Jenny Darren come. At least, he was the one who first drew attention to the soft and persistent knocking on the combings of the main hatch two days after Tommy had been lost overboard. They lifted a hatch cover and saw the pretty face of the girl looking up brightly at them. I've got tired of being down here, she assured them happily, whilst the third mate nearly fell down the hatchway in his astonishment, delight, and surprise at this unexpected wonder from the gods. News of the find was taken to the skipper, who blossomed suddenly with joy and ran like a lad all the way to the hatch, where with his own (laughs) hands he rigged a ladder to enable the dainty maid to ascend from the hold. And Tommy, thoroughly sick of the darkness and able to have come up in a moment like any cat, had to fight down his impatience and finally ascend in decorous fashion, with the third maid and the captain each vying with the other to give her much unnecessary assistance. I always meant to be a stowaway, she explained to the group of officers who now surrounded her. She looked at the captain. I thought I'd come in your ship, oh, I she bet said you did. sweetly. <laughs> she held he was out a bundle. You would. See, she added, I've brought some clothes and there are some more down in that nasty place. Please, Mr. Third Mate, will you get them for me? It was obvious that Tommy was enjoying himself and that he had not been brought up with elder sisters for nothing. Why is that in quotation marks? Why is elder sisters in quotation wait. marks? Are they fake? <laughs> no, he definitely has Quote unquote that. elder sisters. Later, the captain took Miss Jenny the round of the cabin so that she might take her choice. She chose the biggest, but remarked that it smelled fusty, at which, as Tommy had intended, the captain set the steward to scrub it out thoroughly and wash the paintwork. Then, very well satisfied, Tommy returned to the poop and sat languidly in the captain's deck chair whilst the captain and the third mate rigged up a weather cloth to windward of him to protect him from the wind. <laughs> Needless to say, again, Tommy was enjoying himself. He enjoyed especially the efforts of the five other apprentices to obtain surreptitious views of the poop deck. Finally, the third mate also became cognizant of these efforts and went down onto the main deck to explain in his own fashion how unsuited they were to the manners of the captain's young gentleman. 
Tommy, much trained by painful experience, had watched the departure of the third mate, and now listened keenly. Immediately afterwards, the sound of a scuffle, the lad crying out told him that the third mate was indulging his feet. The girl jumped from her chair, furious. Now she would reap the real reward of her position. She raced to the break of the poop and looked down, and the skipper came quickly after her, for he too had heard the muffled sounds, and was perturbed by the swift action of this pretty mate, who was staring down now onto the main deck. Oh, you horrible, brutal man, the skipper heard her say, in clear-cut, passionate tones of scorn that could be heard fore and aft. Fancy a great ugly coward like you kicking a boy. I couldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it. She turned to the skipper. Captain, she said, tensely, looking very pale and likable, for Tommy was truly shaken with anger. Captain, do you allow this sort of thing? And the skipper, who had before now, as you know, been forced to interfere between the third and his victim, though hard himself of heart... <laughs> and pants, found himself in the position of the <laughs> paternal and benevolent captain, forced to speak both didactically and morally. Moreover, he himself was very angry that the third mate should have brought about the scene. He stooped over the rail of the break and looked down at the sullen and half-shamed third where he stood, still holding the lad he had been hammering, whilst a little way off <laughs> waited a group of apprentices the glory hole. looking tense and excited. Let go that boy, mister, said the skipper. I'm ashamed of you, Mr. Davies. I won't have this sort of thing in my ship. Oh, yeah, great, cool. Oh, yeah, now you <laughs> no, won't, the, because there's a... Because the lady said so. Yeah. There's a lady. You beta cucks, you <laughs> sis. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> the third mate stared up furiously at the skipper. He felt that his superior was being gratuitously treacherous. Never before had the skipper posed as a stickler for tenderness to the boys. Go to blazes, muttered the third mate, and flung the boy he held brutally against the hatch. Oh, captain, said the girl's voice, shrill with horror and anger. And the man and the captain answered to the call. Besides, he had been insulted before the girl. He came down the poop ladder in two jumps, his coat dropping on the bottom step. You need manners, mister, he said, and hit the third mate hard in the neck. Curiously, the girl in the poop gave out no scream at this fresh scene of brutality. She seemed to take a personal delight and zest in each heavy blow which the captain got home on the lumbering carcass of the third. Indeed, she danced excitedly from foot to foot. That's what he's been wanting, that's what he's been wanting, she breathed ecstatically to herself as the skipper laid the third flat with a strong punch in the face. And not an onlooker, but echoed the thing in his heart. The third was certainly not beloved in the Lady Hannibal, nor in any other ship where he had been allowed to make himself evident. Captain, said Miss Jenny, when the breathless but triumphant skipper returned to the poop, putting on his coat. Captain, will you shake hands? That man deserved it. She held out her hand, and the skipper, a delighted conquering hero, grasped it. And Put her there, warmly. you can really kick the shit out of those people. <laughs> also, don't beat people. <laughs> I was afraid, Miss Jenny, he said. You'd think I'd been a bit hard, but he needed it. I've had to speak to him before, he added virtuously. He certainly needed it, said Miss Jenny. I'm sure you would never strike a defenseless boy. Tommy was thinking of that bucket the skipper had thrown, besides odd and sundry kicks received in person. But the skipper replied manfully, Never, miss. And somehow the young lady pardoned him the lie without contempt. She, ah, uh, he had done her oh. heart's desire oh. that day. Oh, wow. You got the hebe. I got the hebe jeebs too. Yes. Yeah, it's contagious that in this word, room. word he, it's just really difficult. It's We're in the same room today. H E. No, he you got he the heebie-jeebies and gave them to me because okay, we're I'm like sorry. three feet away from each other. <laughs> yeah, we're in the glory hole together right oh, now. Oh, God. He had done her heart's desire that day and she could forgive much. It was the following morning that Miss Jenny learned the fate of Tommy and returned from the Prentice's birth to the poop to play mourner to her own death. What a dreadful thing, Captain, she said, and I believe the poor boy was driven to it by the brutality of the third mate. I can never sit at table again with that man. I shall always feel he is a murderer. And the skipper was sufficiently alarmed at this view of the matter and his own possible responsibility in the case, not to remove any of the latter from the shoulders of the third mate, but made that much-hammered young man sit down later to his meals alone. Thus did Tommy go forward along the path of virtue, leaving vengeance unto those best able to dispense it. Okay, I guess you could put it that way, sure. Sure. <laughs> In the meantime, he shifted his attention to considering the case of the bosun, who had been somewhat over-attentive in the days of Tommy's apprenticeship. 
Incidentally, while he was turning this matter over in his brain, he improved the condition of the Prentice's berth by insisting on having his tea there every evening with the watch below, to which the reluctant captain found himself forced to give consent and to add privately unusual dietary luxuries to the normal bill of fare of the glory hole, so that he should not fail to stand well with his young enchanter. Certainly the skipper was not coming off scot-free in the scheme of retribution which Master Tommy Dodd had introduced. As for the steward, he groaned in his soul or his apology for that article, for in verity the boys in the Prentice's berth were living almost as well as the cabin. Truly Tommy Dodd was a great man! Exclamation <laughs> point. <laughs> wow. Okay. One day, whilst Tommy and the skipper were pacing the poop together, the latter waxed paternal. Tommy had been speaking of the Prentices, a common topic of his, for when not with the captain, Miss Jenny was sure to be found in the Prentices' berth. "'You mustn't let them boys be too free with you, Miss Jenny,' said the captain. "'No,' said Miss Jenny demurely. "'They've never, er, any of them tried to kiss you or any nonsense of that sort?' asked the skipper, a little hesitatingly. Never, said Miss Jenny emphatically, which was in every way true. You just tell me, Miss Jenny, if anyone ever bothers you. I'll deal with them, the captain assured her fervently, and Tommy thought he might venture to put the first spoke in the bosun's wheel. I, I don't like the bosun, said Tommy in a shy voice. He looks rudely at me, which was likely enough, for it is to be doubted whether the bosun had ever looked otherwise at any woman. He's a nasty boy. I'll settle him quick, said the captain, and began to walk towards the break of the poop. The dirty scum, I beg pardon, miss, but the very idea. No, said Tommy simply. Don't touch him, please, but I do wish you'd make him clean out that pigsty forward. It smells horridly whenever I go past. I've told him once. I told him he ought to get inside and clean it properly himself instead of making the boys. Don't you think it's a man's work, captain? It needs such hard scrubbing, I should think. He was so rude when I told him. Come along forward with me, miss, said the captain. I'll just have a look at that pigsty. I'll learn him to so rude. That's got shit in there. It's got pigs <laughs> I'll learn him to there. so rude. Oh, you know, is there something a bit Furby-ish about Ken's Jenny voice? That's kind of <laughs> getting me a little bit. I'm just imagining Jenny as a Furby. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Jesus yeah. No, that really struck it. <laughs> I was, oh, I was right. I saw the depths in you, Ken. <laughs> That's how you know oh. Ken has had a, wait, Ken, did you have a Furby? I did not. Oh it's my god, how did you do that? to own another Furby. <laughs> oh, that's so sad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, anyway, continue. The captain went forward with the girl, and together they inspected the pigsty. Like most styes, it smelled on the quote-unquote strong side. But to the infatuated skipper, this was sufficient. It smelled. He sent for the bosun, meaning to make the pigsty an excuse for letting off his wrath at the bosun, because that man of tar and sin had dared to even look in the direction of his pretty companion. That man of tar and sin. Yeah, I'm wondering God about that yeah. too, yeah. Right. I'm real questionable there. Yeah. I didn't want to say anything because I couldn't assume, but you know. I'm wondering if that's some Victorian oh, no. or what. <laughs> Oh. Well, no, it, a sailor is an old tar because tar is what you use to waterproof a vessel and also your clothes oh. and also your hair. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. For once, the Victorians just... are not doing a racism. Okay. You know, I'll I... let them off. Let yeah. them off. We don't have to kick them scientifically for this one. <laughs> Get a bucket and broom smart now, said the skipper harshly when the man arrived. Get some of the boys to fetch water along for you, and give that sty a proper clean-out. It's a disgrace to any ship, a foul, stinking thing like this. Makes the young lady sick every time she passes it, and I don't wonder. The bosun glared angrily at the girl, for whom already he had achieved a strong antipathy. But he obeyed the skipper in silence, for the skipper was a quote-unquote tough, and notorious at that with his fists. When the water came, the man began to clean out the sty in the usual sailor man fashion, that is, with buckets of salt water and a long-handled deck broom. Why don't you go in, bosun, like you make the boys? asked Miss Jenny quietly. You stow it, miss, said the bosun, nearly bursting. You don't understand ship work, you don't. Silence, you clawed foot, roared the skipper. The lady's right. You get inside and do it on your hands and knees. 
The bosun straightened up, and Tommy, to his joy, perceived that there was going to be bad trouble. The skipper saw it in the same moment, else he had never earned his title as a bucko. <laughs> Whatever the <laughs> fuck yeah. that is. Yeah, what right. is a bucko? Oh, he, you, you're a bucko now. A He's bucko. the bucko. <laughs> And he hit the bosun hard and solid in the wind, then bundled him limp and gasping into the iron-barred sty. He shouted to a man to go aft to the steward for a padlock, and with this he secured the iron-barred door, which closed the only entrance to the sty. Now he's definitely a bucko, okay? Don't ever question that he's not a bucko. Yeah, he imprisoned a man in a pig sty. <laughs> That's bucko behavior, 10 out of 10. It's Alpha, Sigma, Beta, and Bucko. <laughs> yeah, that's true. The fourth. <laughs> I am the Alpha and the Bucko. <laughs> now, my lad, said the skipper, I'll learn you to be civil. You stays in there long of the pigs till you've scrubbed that sty out good on your hands and knees. And if you wants water, here's water. And he hove a dozen buckets of salt water over the cooped man. Like one what, at a time? At like, like one... Two, yeah, he made him three, <laughs> four, five, five six, six, seven, eight, seven, nine, ten. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Someone else gets the buckets. You have to like fill the buckets. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Wait, so they just had twelve separate buckets full of salt water? Just, just. I, guess that's I how can't imagine leaving. they did. <laughs> yeah. that you would had be to go insane. back and refill them. Like the bosun didn't get out of the way every time the. the, the <laughs> The skipper came back. And just... Yeah, the the sort of logistics of by, the By, scene. like, time eight, you would, like, okay, uh, yeah, I, I get I, it. I get it. I'm going to move out of the way. I don't know. And as Tommy went aft and ascended the poop ladder with the skipper, he heard the sounds of stifled mirth proceeding evidently from the Prentice's birth, and B knew that joy reigned in the glory hole, for all <laughs> the ship was aware that the skipper had locked the bosun in the pigsty. Pretty sure that B is just a typo. It keeps happening. Yeah, it doesn't stop from time. happening. Second huh. time. Feels like a typo. From now onwards, so far at least as the Prentices were concerned, the voyage was very pleasant, for Miss Jenny held the skipper religiously to his paternal and benevolent attitude towards his young gentleman. Whilst that same captain, though the father of a large family, grew daily more enamored of his fair passenger. Ugh. One morning, when the decks were being wet down and Miss Jenny was paddling about gaily with bare feet in the cool water, oh dear, the captain's affections got the better of his discretion. Oh, no, 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 no. He's the footman. The foot stuff put him over the edge, guys. For having gallantly offered to hold Miss Jenny's shoes for her while she sat and dried her feet, B so far forgot himself as to stoop quickly and kiss her poke unquote pretty toes as he termed them. I'm going okay. to, y I'm gonna yart. Yeah. I regret ever starting a podcast. <laughs> yep, I'm gonna. I regret eat ever starting a life son. for myself. <laughs> oh, you know, it always comes we, back to feet, guys, doesn't it? You know, when, somehow... we, when we started this, I was like, oh, we're just gonna make jokes about the glory hole, but now there's like, it's like. Pedophile foot stuff happening. This is rough. <laughs> At once, Miss Jenny was all dignity and rose from the captain's chair to display this new attribute to full advantage, being the better able to act with feeling because of the snigger from the man at the wheel which had followed the skipper's act. I'm ashamed of you, Captain, said Miss Jenny with superb simpleness, and taking her shoes from his now limp hand, she descended to the cabin. I said I'd make him, said Tommy, righteously to himself as he entered the cabin, and I guess I'm square all round now. We're all round? I mean, that does wait, circle round. All right, square. yeah, nice try, buddy. We No mathematic kick is going to admit to being square all round. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If the kick has got corners on it, then you can you square, because it's a round boot, and it's corn. Okay, I don't know. <laughs> It was on the day that the Lady Hannibal entered London docks that Miss Jenny took the captain on one side, as it were, and made known the plain, unvarnished truth. I've not have told you at all, Captain, she said, for you've really been a brick the way you hammered the third and the bosun, but I couldn't have you writing home to my people that I was drowned. Besides, there might be other complications. All the same, if you'd like to shake hands and be friends, I'll not tell a soul that no one can laugh at you. But I guess I got level with you all. 
and the skipper, dumb with emotion of a strong and varied kind, shook hands speechlessly with this pretty girl, who assured him that she was Tommy Dodd, his youngest prentice. The other fellows will see about my chest, sir, said Tommy, and I'll change into my ordinary togs ashore. Then no one here will know. The skipper nodded, still silent, and Tommy went up out of the cabin. Lord, muttered the skipper, maybe half an hour later. Good Lord, he scratched his rough head, and I kissed his blessed feet. Thus ends another thrilling tale from the creator of Karnaki, the Ghost Finder. <laughs> wait, Bro, there's, what wait, the there's fuck? like a, not a hymn, there's like a song. Wait, there's, wait, are we not seeing the little Oh, wait, sorry, song? is there a song? song or- what song are you talking song? about? And we is what? under the where sea. Where are you seeing where the wild no, horses go? I, horses with tails <laughs> as big as a whale. That's the next, next story in the collection. Oh, you see, whoa, that's the next story in the collection. That's not. Well, spoilers. I mean... That's the next story. <laughs> okay, well, there's that is no the opening to the seahorses. <laughs> there's no division or title in mine. It just literally says and i kissed his blessed feet and then it's immediately this like song how do you get these weird formatting <laughs> things happen Chris, I, look at this I, 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 okay we're in the same room we're in the same thing. room so i will prove okay paris is not lying this here there is, is what, indeed that's uh, what i got okay i'm gonna but, take a screenshot and put it in okay, the chat okay but look <laughs> no <laughs> no all right i'm gonna take you I'll take you a screenshot of what i'm seeing here this is what i got <laughs> i'm sending it in the chat in the facebook chat Thrilling audio content. <laughs> yeah, you can see it. <laughs> I just want you all to know that I'm not fucking making this up, and I, it does actually. I believe like that. you. It is really more. funny that it always does fall to you to have like the formatting issues. Is, is it your <laughs> you Android phone? You one. Android phone haver. Well, this is what we determined last time. It was because I was on an Android, not an iPhone. I have no <laughs> idea why Android? that matters. Well, <laughs> I also okay. want an Android. Okay, then I don't know what the fuck is going on. I don't on. know. Then that, I mean, that's, you're seeing it. Okay, I get, yeah, we believe you, Paris. We're not trying to gaslight you here. It's just really funny. You're right that it does just go right. We believe like you, lane. Paris, if that is your real name. <laughs> yeah, if, if Paris, you Are you mean. Tommy Dodd in disguise this whole time? Well, this also explains. Having one over on me uh, for having kicked you? Well, this, is, this is also, well, this also explains why I thought it was supremely long, because it just keeps going. There's no break on my version, that so I was like, wow, this is long that. as hell. <laughs> oh, fuck me. I hate that. <sighs> so yeah, I would say the Karnaki stories are better. Uh, yeah, yeah, I would agree. This is just about some dude that dresses up as a lady. To... This is some real Huck Finn shit, which is not my jam. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Although... I did think it was funny until it got weird. Yeah, I I don't I was very concerned that there was gonna be some you know, some more illicit stuff going on. They, they couldn't even say corset in this yeah. Paris. But they we still gonna... got fucking yeah. pedophile foot stuff. That's different back then. They didn't <laughs> care. Ugh. Okay, Ugh. but how funny would it be if he was just like, Alright, it was me, like I guess you're embarrassed now, and then he's just like, What makes you think we're fucking done here? <laughs> oh, hold on, wait, wait. Oh, I don't God. care. <laughs> Get on your knees again, Skipper. <laughs> no. Oh, no. No, no, no. <laughs> All right. Pretty toes, uh, here's... pretty toes, boy. I mean, but you know, you know someone out there already fanfic this. It already happened. No. I, I mean. No one, no, no. No one would do that. It's too obscure, Paris. It's too yeah, obscure. Just, I I you shouldn't do that. And you honestly, think... there's so... There's so much more foot content out there that I don't yeah. think we need to dig this deep. That's fair, that's fair. Yeah. This is nautical foot content, which that's is true. hyper specific. That is true. So maybe there's some niche person yeah. out there that's like really like my Karnacki uh, foot boy Tommy Dodd cosplay. Oh, God. I miss the ghost horse. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I also yeah. miss the ghost yeah. horse. The, I, the, 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 the non-Karnacki... Hodgson stuff is just kind of boring. So I guess what I guess now we understand why people liked the neck because it was <laughs> it wasn't weird oh. at least. <laughs> they, they had read all the other stuff. I miss the pig room. <laughs> yeah, Dude, the pig, pig room. the pig in the end I miss house. The or whatever burning clown. <laughs> <laughs> the burning guys. We had so many good times with burning clowns and ghost yeah, horses clowns. and. I and really pig, had to lean on Glory S&M Hole the whole time void, here. Yeah. Like I'll be honest yeah, with you, I, I had to keep coming back to that. Yeah, it was a lot of that. 
<laughs> oh, well, that was another terrible antique book freak. Uh, we that was it. easily one of the stories I've read in my life. <laughs> uh, well, we hope this was fun for y'all. We know you keep asking us to do these, so we keep putting us through this misery, and we hope it results in further enjoyment. Listen, we're bringing what we can for the William Ho Hodgson stuff. The content ain't great. It's really just like, and he dressed up like a lady, and they were kicking each other, and then he kissed the feet. That the end. This yeah, is really exciting. a new horizon for William Hope Hodgson's weird gay thing. Yeah. True. That's true. definitely a through line. That's yeah, definitely that's true. A through <laughs> you're right. You're right. Because like S and M Pig Void was like the apex. That was like the supreme. Yeah, gay. we disassociated fully into the S and M Pig Void yeah. over there. Yeah. I, did and this come up more before? Of like a, a Mulan thing? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, that's that's true. What is the what is the timeline here, Ken? Do you know which came first, the knacking or these? I, I think they were all written concurrently. As far as I know, he was working on his straightforward nautical stories at the same time he was working on the fantasy fiction. As I understand it, like, the fantasy fiction was, like, his passion project that didn't necessarily sell well while he was alive, but became more popular after his death due to H.P. Lovecraft and Clark Action Smith, like, citing him as an influence on their own work. Mm-hmm. Okay. You don't see sense. a lot of cross-dressing nautical stories in H.P. Lovecraft, so like that part didn't stick clearly. No, yeah. I think it. Yeah, I think he was inspired more by the Karnacki and other weird stories than, you know, you the a, more, quote unquote, straightforward nautical adventure. You don't see a lot of foot kissing in, in Lovecraft. No, no, or in Thank maybe God that's that. what he meant when he said he saw things beyond his comprehension in the void. He that's saw true. ten little piggies, and he hated yeah, it. Is... <laughs> maybe the color out of space was just the color of a man kissing small toes. Maybe that, that's... that's yeah. a very little, little specific toes. shade. Yeah, really. You don't really toes. see that in the bear catalog that often. Only right? mantis shrimp Man see kissing it. pretty piggies. Only like... mantis shrimp. They're the only ones. They all yeah, it's more of a pharaoh and ball color. Yeah. Don't do that to mantis shrimp. Don't make it so that they have to see foot fetish colors all the time. Uh, well, they've got what a hundred. They're my favorite rods animals. <laughs> yeah, they got they, all those rods and cones, D. They can perceive. I love them like, so dearly. I don't want this for them. <laughs> they are wonderful. I agree. Even though I I don't much love sea creatures, but they're very cool. Mantis shrimp, everyone, check them out. Yes, we've learned. Uh, I raised them for a while. What? I have I have raised some anti shrimp. Those yeah. are very dangerous. You had bulletproof tanks. Uh, well, mine was little. That it's really only so that's it's that's a risk kind of unique to peacock mantis shrimp. Oh, I see. They've got the bullet arms. D also got banned from the mantis shrimp Facebook group. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry, D. How did you get banned, D? Would you like to uh, share with the class what listen, action I'm banned you from D's this particular crying. Facebook listen, group? I am I am against <laughs> hand feeding mantis shrimp. I am ha- right. That wasn't what got you shrimp. banned, though. You being against <laughs> hand feeding mantis shrimp no, wasn't was, what got you kicked out. No, that was that was part of it. That was part of it. There was a guy who was hand feeding mantis shrimp, and I said, "Hey, you shouldn't do that. You're encouraging other people to do that, and these are at their base right. dangerous animals. Do you especially right. like uh-huh. if, you're, if you're putting your meat next to their little raptorial appendages? Mm-hmm. Uh, but that wasn't what got you like banned. A, as, you know, you're bringing down sort of like the the group IQ. People are going to are like take the wrong message from this. This is bad husbandry. You know." And, uh-huh. and then, well, well, and then he cussed me out for telling him how to raise his animals. And then, so I, so I told him I was going to have sex with his wife. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and well, I see what I think happened that's once. the part that got you banned, D. <laughs> that was the part that got me banned. <laughs> Listen, I admit to but my crimes. I just need you to have the background it needed context to be, of why I deserve need, to have like, sex the, with the only this knew- man's wife. <laughs> He only knew one consequence, and <laughs> <laughs> he no, he was unmoved by losing a finger. So I thought, right. what if you lost your wife <laughs> to me? <laughs> Not yeah, in I can't, death. can't imagine D Not being death, like though. you know telling someone off for hand feeding the shrimp. He's like, "Fuck you, D," and then he's like, "I'm gonna fuck your wife, bro." Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> I mean, if only she'd actually I wish done I'd... it though. That would have been the better end of the story. Bands. I wish I still had it because I can't remember, but I did pun it. 
Uh, like okay. Mantis where, it, where he was like it was it was something along the it was, this wasn't exactly it but it was something along the lines of I can stick my hands in there anytime I want and I was like you're not gonna be singing the same tune when I stick my hands inside your mouth. Oh, Jesus Christ! It was something no. like that. I was I was Gino. ripping off of something he said, and in my credit, it was funny. It was like super funny. <laughs> I got a lot of I got a little little thumbs up before I got banned. Yeah, no, that's about all you care. That's all <laughs> yeah, that happens. That's all that happens. That's all matters. Like right before they take <laughs> everyone knows if right before they take you out for like the electric chair, if like the guy behind the glass goes like cool murder, then yeah. it's all worth it. It's all for the emotions. Yeah, if he's if he's like that was really funny. Yeah. And everyone was like, That was really funny. And I, was, and I was like, Yeah, it was really funny. Thank you. Zap. Don't put your hands in the tank of the mantis shrimp. <laughs> That All is right, the point on which I do agree. Don't put your hands in the mantis shrimp tank. Yeah, don't do Unless that. You that not probably don't hand feed. It's it's edgy douche lord behavior. Like, get tongs like everyone else yeah. and feed them safely for you and them. I uh, this, this should probably go with the after the credits roll. <laughs> probably. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is a very extremely long thing. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for listening to the getting even of Tommy Dot. He sure did get even. Yeah, he got, he got he even. He got his little t- piggies smooched. I think All we should keep in the whole mantis shrimp thing. <laughs> oh, we're going to keep it in. It's just... We I, I it. think it should be, you know, front Main and center. Content. I, think it should be the okay. top, I think it should be the top of the episode, actually, before we even talk about <laughs> it. It's really up to Dean. I think we Dean should delete the rest time. of the episode and just have the mantis shrimp in. I, well, you know, it's, I'm 100% okay with it at this point. It was years ago. Um, I've I'm done a my better time. person now. I've been scientifically booted I, about it already. Yeah. I, you know, I, I do not escalate when I tell people to get better at husbandry any longer. Yeah. You get better at Grown. husbandry because you're going to fuck his wife. You should <laughs> on, on every fucking level because if you're not a good husband, I'm coming in. <laughs> Shit. All right, everybody. <gasps> Oh boy. <laughs> See you next time for however we get to more of these crimes at the yeah. end of some short story. Yeah, what crime is next? <laughs> stay, tuned. Stay, tuned. stay tuned for other groups I've been kicked out of. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, folks. Thank you very much. We will see you uh, next time, whatever that is. Bye. Bye. Au revoir. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of Terrible Book Club. Terrible Book Club is an independent podcast produced by your hosts, Paris and Chris. Sound design and audio editing by Chris, with sound effects and music by Epidemic Sound and sometimes also Chris. Our theme song is Kiss by Yearn, which is, you guessed it, actually, also Chris. You can find more of his soothing synthy sounds on Bandcamp at yearn.bandcamp.com. Do you want us to review a book of your choice on the show? Do you want access to some extra audiovisual weirdness? If so, become a patron at patreon.com slash terriblebookclub. If you'd like to send us a one-time tip instead, you can do that at ko-fi.com slash terriblebookclub. You can also support TBC for free by sharing the show on social media, following our accounts on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or Goodreads, telling your friends about your favorite episode, or by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, or anywhere else on the internet. To send us book recommendations or your adorable pet photos, send an email to terriblebookclub at gmail.com. <laughs>